shining a beacon on the bazaar. I tell you some are kid, it's really starting to bucket it down oh, out there, isn't it? How cosy is it though when that rain on room? I know. I love it. <laughs> do you know the best thing about rainy days? What? You can't do any jobs. It's <laughs> true, <laughs> we don't chuff in out all day. Well that's the best thing, we just don't do anything. Have a little bit of a lounge. You see you've been having a bit of a read, haven't Oh, we? it's been it's Little oh. Boat Weekly. I love this read, man. I love it, it's one of my favourites. Little Boat Weekly oh that's your little uh, you got a bit of a Weekly, that's what that. Robo beats brings to me every week I love it a little boat you've got your dream of your I have boat. one day I will own a little boat oh bless you well you've read about four times now I know no, I am to be honest with you I'm just looking at pictures now <laughs> <laughs> well I'll tell you what how about on a rainy day like this right? just before we get the light lit to make mm. sure that everyone feels a bit safe and stuff why did I do a bit of casting? Oh, have you been casting? I've been casting! Oh, good lad! <laughs> Lovely bubbly! <laughs> That's what we like in it. So, you pour yourself another little rum there. Yeah. Oh, now I'll have one. Do you want to do a little nip? There I'll you have a go. Nip. <laughs> a little nip of rum. <laughs> Aye. And let's see what we can see. <laughs> But before we do that, we've got to introduce ourselves. Oh, well done, our kid. <laughs> you're Matt. And you're Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Cracking Cove, the podcast that shines a beacon onto the bazaar. And when I say I'm doing a bit of casting, what I like to do, I cast my light out over the sea. And, and I see, I pick out the weirdnesses, the strangenesses, the odd stories that are out there. And so, it's, sometimes it's from history, sometimes it's brand new. But you always winkle out some at good. Oh, well, that's what we need to do, a bit of winkling like that, you know. And on a rainy day like today, it's absolutely bucketing it down. What better thing to do than cast a light out? Aye. Let's get cracking. <laughs> <laughs> now, first things first then, our kid, right? What do you know about sharks? They're old. They haven't changed or evolved for thousands and millions of years or something. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, what's, what? the mo- what's the most famous part of a shark? It's teeth. It's his teeth. And where is its teeth? In its gob. <laughs> where else is its teeth? Where else? Yes. Oh, so he's got more, more than one set of chompers? In a way, yeah. You could say that, right? <laughs> shaggy bum bum. <laughs> In his shaggy bum bum. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall I tell you? Please. Well, the world's biggest shark has teeth. On its eyeballs. Oh, scientists wow. discover. <laughs> <laughs> to get little fish as well as that. It's greedy. Well, this is by Hannah Osborne in Newsweek. And she says the biggest sharks in the world have tiny teeth all over their eyeballs. Oh, on the eye, but not the eye, yeah, not the eyeballs. Not the eyelids, or yeah, yeah. Like that. No, 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 on the actual oh. eyeball, right? And in analysing the eyes of whale sharks, which, which can reach up to 60 feet in length. Wow. Researchers found them to be covered in dermal denticles that help protect them from damage. <laughs> and I said denticles. <laughs> <laughs> you were giggling. You're like that one. <laughs> you, you, you sounded a bit like testicles. <laughs> dermal denticles are known to cover shark skin as well. Well, I've heard that, you know, those, the, I think the band, or they might be band, those swimming outfits that um, they use, it went to, like, next-level technology, so, yeah, didn't it? Right, you know, yeah, it's like the so. scaly type of, yeah. toothy type of, um, go faster. Yeah, that's right. So, um... But what a dermal denticle is, obviously with this thing that's synthesised in some of those swimsuits, they are tiny V-shaped scales that are structurally minute teeth. Wow. They are made from tooth material. Right. Oh, there she blows. There she blows. <laughs> <laughs> so according to the Smithsonian Institution's Ocean Portal, shark skin is covered in dermal denticles to decrease turbulence and drag. Helping them to swim quieter and faster. Quieter. Yeah, yeah. I like that. It's a little yeah. bit stealthy, isn't it? Yeah, well. I know. So, in a study published in the journal Plus One, researchers led by Takateru Tomita from the Okinawa Churashima Research Center, Japan, found dermal denticles on the eyes of whale sharks, a filter feeding species known for its unique spotted patterned skin. 
Researchers say that many species have eyelids to protect their eyeballs, and some sharks have third eyelids that cover their eyes during feeding. They roll back in their head. Dead eyes, doll's <laughs> eyes. And they roll over the white. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that before, but I can't I love that film. So the outer surface of which is covered in dermal denticles. These again, here we go. So other species, they say, instead have retractable eyeballs. That's what you see when it goes black and you said there's ah, it goes yeah. back. It has a retractable eye to protect it yeah, when yes. it's, you know, when, when it's when it's feeding. And this is why they do say it's, you either punch it on the nose or try and get your thumb in its eye. Wow, is that another another yeah, sensitive yeah. Try and get your thumb in its eye. The only know. other day, some uh, lady was getting attacked and some dude would be off. Oh, her husband? A friend. Oh, her husband. husband did you read did it? it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he just climbed the bottom and started twatting yeah, it. Yeah, I love it? that. Yeah, yeah. Beating the crap out I of the shark. I think it had all of a leg and it was in shallow waters. And yeah. It was an actually, it was a juvenile great white. Was wow. That. And, it, and it was, so I, I don't think it was even swimming depth of waters. Right, it yeah. was just sort of like wading. Yeah, and they come in low, don't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he came in, snatched a leg, and was ready to drag her out. Jesus. But he actually jumped on his back. I did it. Oh, I love that. In pub afterwards, you ain't proper here, <laughs> yeah. not you? What's up with your knuckles, dear? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll have eight pints and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I do his knuckles? Must have been like that. Oh, yeah. The dermal denticles are written on the inside of him, what, you know. So whale sharks have eyes that project out of their orbit, so it's a, the bulge out, right, not soft set back. Yeah, yeah. A feature that could result in an increased risk of injury. They do not have eyelids, and the only known protection mechanism is that the species can rotate the entire eyeball back into the socket. Wow. Right, so it can happen like that. So studying large ocean creatures like whale sharks has traditionally been difficult. Oh, it's rolling again. <laughs> as a result of their small population size. In the latest study, the team took advantage of the recent care of whale sharks in aquariums, along with dead specimens. They used a range of techniques to examine their eye protection morphology and compared them to other shark species. Findings showed whale sharks have unique armoured eyes. Its teeth-covered eyeballs, the team say, are a novel form of eye protection amongst vertebrates. The identical differs in morphology from that of the dermal denticles distributed over the rest of the body, they wrote, saying they are for abrasion resistance rather than speed and noise reduction. So the birds are saying it's just armor. That's yeah, what they're doing, yeah. you know what I mean? So because obviously as well that flying through the, the sea, uh, anything could either latch on yeah, or graze yeah, against it. Yeah. Is that a bit when they're going to punch him for attack as well, isn't yeah. it? You're well, well, there. well, whale sharks don't. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, filter sorry. feeder. Yeah, 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 they're filter feeder. But it's odd to think because sometimes people tend to think of the larger sharks as being more primitive sharks. Yeah. But here we have a case of um, a peaceful, you know, krill feeding filter feeder yeah. um, with a quite a complex and unusual protection device. Yeah. You know what I mean? Something like that. So I think that's pretty interesting. So as far as we know, identicals have not been found in any other elasma branches, such as sharks, rays and skates, including species closely related to the whale shark, they wrote. It seems likely, therefore, the identicals are a characteristic unique to the whale shark. The findings also show whale sharks are able to partially retract and rotate eyeballs, like we said, mm -hmm. uh, so that that's a little bit of extra protection. So yeah, this is pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I wonder about there though, if you've got a, a, you, if you've got your eyeball all covered in like mini mini teeth, and you roll it back in your head, well, like, oh. it causes a bit of grating, do you think? I think it's got to be used to it, like calloused up or something. Yeah, some sort of like leathery ball. So maybe, maybe even on the inside, it's maybe got How something. How do they see so well with it all like toothed up? Is just like well, I don't, I don't think they do see particularly well a lot, a, a lot of sharks. Yeah, uh, a lot the of them. Senses, <coughs> I mean, for example, the Greenland. The, the, I think it's the Greenland shark in the sixth. Oh, shark. I love the green. Is that the one that's under that, the oldest but, shark? The yeah. one underneath. Yeah, they like eats once a year or something like well, that. Well, if you take a little look at some of them, so, uh, quite often they're completely blind. Yeah, they're I like have a, heard. Yeah, you've seen yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like a little worm, like a little worm sort of attaches to the right, oh. blinds them, but they don't sleep in mind because they don't. It's in darkness. They're down at the bottom of the sea. They're not really using their eyes. Yeah, yeah. It's all scent and the electric sensory organs because yeah, yeah. they have these little picks down the side of the body. Right. They pick up electrical senses of fish and in, in, in 
stress and, 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 exactly yeah. and stress and things like this so they use other senses so the vision isn't massively important they're an ugly brute then though aren't they when you see them yeah. really it's like murky under ice and that they're proper ugly Beating brute as well they are, and they've yeah. got, they got some pointy teeth now they've got like almost like graters like they? Right. Yeah, 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 very, remember very unusual and they, they think they, they don't know how old they could live to they think they could be living yeah. even thousands of years yeah, old yeah I've heard that yeah they're yeah. like really old animals Cool. Well, that's the thing. Is you look out the window here, the uh, cracking curb. We, we came, we've had whale sharks here. Well, yeah, know? washed up a couple of times. Yeah, yeah that's it. You know, we've had all sorts washed up here. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's, a, it's some usual findings. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, interesting stuff. I'm still looking out for that uh, whale spew though. That costs a fortune, doesn't it? Oh no, is it, is it whale spew? Oh no, well, well um, it's yeah, not oh, shark. Uh, it's whales. Whales it? is whale sick. ambergris. Yeah, he's got his car. Ambergris. Yeah. Quids yeah. in there though. Yeah, I yeah, can get a load of that. A few buckets of that myself. And it's not, it's the, um, it, and, and it is vomit, it is whale vomit, is yeah. Ambergris. But, um, like you say, it's, I'm not sure what part of it it comes from, is Ambergris. Again, yeah. we'll have to have a little look at yeah, it. Maybe we cover a little bit of the uh, strangeness of whales next week. Ooh, I like that, yeah, yeah. The yeah. strangeness of whales. <laughs> <laughs> seas now we're going to go on a bit of dry land you know what I mean I mean there must be there's no dry land at all on Cracking Cove today is there? <laughs> the rain is all slippery wet <laughs> slippery wet but you know we're, we're toasty in here <laughs> we? they like this <laughs> so we're going we're going abroad we're going to we're going to America now oh nice yeah. hotter so we're looking at insects right so do you know what a cicada is no. right okay well we'll, we'll, we'll find out we'll find out <laughs> I'll post a educate picture. me yeah, yeah. Like, yeah that's it in fact, why don't I find a little picture? Yeah, educate me now. Right, so here's a picture now. This we is the leaning. Ooh, pretty colours. Yeah. Like a, a moth beetle type yeah. of lovely colours to it. Yeah, so it's a very strange creature, isn't it? You God, know I've never mean? really seen one like it. That's, yeah, yeah. Very, very odd. Well, if you did see one, pretty quickly you, you won't want to see them very much longer. Oh, right. right. <laughs> there can be a little bit of a pain in the arse, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this story is. Invading cicadas may turn into sex crazed zombies this summer. <laughs> <laughs> Great title. Yeah. So, this is by Catherine Tutron uh, from Vice News, right? Mm -hmm. And she puts it The cicada summer is here. Millions of periodical cicadas are emerging across Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina. After hibernating underground, right? So how long do you think these are hibernating? Man, I have no uh, idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a long time ago, and it's, it's something crazy, like 20 years or 25 yeah. years, isn't it? This is 17 years. Wow. 17 years is one. So, I mean, you're in the right ballpark there. You know, oh, you could, could God, I can't there. remember all about it, though. Go on, casting. So, in the time they've been underground, they've missed the entire creation of YouTube, and Trump being elected. <laughs> <laughs> so they're popping out in a bit of a weird world of these cicadas, aren't they? You know? <laughs> so the cicada's unique life cycle comes as a means of predator avoidance. Scientists theorise cicadas spend a prime number of years underground, 13 or 17 years, depending on the species, yeah. to avoid syncing up with predators. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing, isn't it? Nothing could evolve to get them. Yeah. There's a lot of weird stuff with these. Go, go on, Very odd, tell. yeah, yeah. But very primitive, very primitive creatures yeah, in their yeah. own right, yeah. Then, by descending in unison. Well, uh, do you know, say by de descending, I'm just going to, I'm going to, all of these, they don't descend. They yeah. climb, they ascend. Uh -huh. Because they come out from underground. Wow. That's the thing, they come out from underground of the cicadas. The only way they descend, in a way, is that they kind of break out from there. They climb a tree yeah. in their sort of like in their their sort of state, which is like a like a grub state, yeah, and then yeah. they burst out from the tree. Wow. So they do descend in that sense. Yeah. But basically, they all come out of the ground yeah, together, yeah. cling onto the trees, telegraph poles, whatever they yeah. want, and then they burst out. Jesus, like a swarm. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it is yeah. in a way, but it's it, it's the don't sort of, it's not like the sort of like you know like a locust sort of travel across the ground of yeah. the land millions you know the yeah. swarm you can go hundreds of miles and yeah, they don't they just stay where they are yeah, yeah they stay where they are so when they do sort of like break out in unison the millions of clumsy defenseless cicadas can overwhelm predators and stand a chance of survival. Bit of thunder there, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
but this year's cicadas have an even bigger thing to worry about above surface. A hallucinogenic fungus that turns them into sex-crazed zombies! <laughs> oh, wow! This fungus, called Massospora cicadina, invades the cicada and causes its abdomen to slide off. Oh, so its ass yeah, falls off. It slides <laughs> off. Oh, that's a horrible way. It's a horrible way of putting it. I'm about to fall off and slide. I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, 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 my ass slides off. <laughs> so the cicadas enter a zombie like state, driven to mate with anything they can find. But their efforts are fruitless. Because they've got no jennies left to Because watch. the fungus has eaten away their butts and genitals. Oh, yes. no. And you proper want it. Oh, <laughs> You're no. Gasping, gasping for a bit. Oh, Shit. no. So the fungus acts much like an STD. The spores scatter as cicadas wiggle their infected bodies during their sex rampage. <laughs> <laughs> One West Virginia University researcher describes them as flying salt shakers of death. Oh, wow. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's a bit weird doing it. Well, the thing is with uh, cicadas, what I'll do is I'll, I'm, I'm going to find a little bit of cicada, um, what the sound like. Yeah, yeah. Um, because actually, going back to sound weapons, yeah, this this is the cicada that I think is to blame for a lot of people where they think they can hear awful noises like this. Right. Because they 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 all chirr or you know when yeah. they, it's not with the vocal cords they're using the legs. Yeah, yeah. Like cricket style, thing. yeah. Cricket style, yeah. But because there's so many millions of them, yeah. sometimes it can make like a resonance. Wow. Like a, that used to be for the wow wow wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got the, the, Oh, damn, we should have done. We're going to do a bit of practice rolling that back out, eh? <laughs> but, um, but no, so that sometimes that can make people feel ill. And you yeah. know, in areas where the cicadas, because they do it all night as well, you don't get any sleep. You know, yeah, yeah. Just spite, you know. Probably like once every 15 years, you're not ready for it in a way. What the hell is that? Oh, no, it must do your head in. It must absolutely do your head in. If it were me, I think I'd just take a holiday on that. I'd <laughs> yeah. go somewhere else, you know. So this phenomena has been going on for generations. But only last year did researchers from West Virginia University discover the chemical mechanisms driving the zombie takeover. Cathinone, an amphetamine referred to as bath salts, <laughs> and psilocybin, the psychoactive compound in magic mushrooms. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> We're on your turf now. <laughs> <laughs> this was a breakthrough discovery of psilocybin in any fungi other than mushrooms. So oh. it's not in anything else. So basically, yeah. I bet you, could, you could fry a few of these bad boys up. Yeah. All the, all the rotten butts. Yeah, <laughs> all the zombie butts and yeah. that. <laughs> Understanding how these compounds, only found commonly in plants, are able to exist in an insect could provide a pathway for developing drugs for humans. Oh. Psilocybin, in particular, is pivotal in research to treat mental health conditions, including PTSD and depression. And just to clarify as well, near death as well, you know, if you've got cancer, terminal cancers, or you're really facing the end, you know what I mean? They're really, it's yeah, a massive, high. No, it's, it's a yeah. big fight at the moment to try and get it legalised because you can actually contemplate it properly on it, you know what I mean? Oh, right, that's yeah. No, it's so just in news last week. Oh, actually. but I'm, I must admit, I'm, um, I'm not a big one for, for drugs, as you well know, but it's like, um, I'm a big believer in the old, uh, the, the I think the drugs in magic mushrooms or psilocybin, I think it's meant to be very good for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very much linked, wires up to the human mind. Exactly. It's exactly. something you know. you'd want to be doing all the time, but I think there's a time and a place. In well, it depends if you microdose it. <laughs> yeah, true, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So fortunately, there have not been any reports of zombie cicadas just yet, right? But if you are so tempted to inspect the bums of cicadas and happen to be in the mid Atlantic over the next month, just follow the sound of a lawnmower. Wow, is that because what that's what it sounds like. Wow. It's like a... well, I ended up knowing about them because they were like, I think they were like one of their Netflix shows, and it was like about codes. Oh yeah. And if you've got a chance to, you know, have Netflix and watch it, it's a really good show. And about you know, like the trippy nature of code in, in nature, you know, like yeah. how the spirals of certain flowers and rocks and shells, and, yeah. and they went through all sorts of proper trip, really the, good. The mandel brought set. exactly, yeah, yeah, that yeah that's it, nature. man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they went on to them, you know, what I mean, just saying that that mixed that evolved 
where they can't get that predator and just all the whole thing about him, you know, living. So he's so clever. You think how can he evolve that long to get it right and find it? Yeah. But so is that spore directly attacking them, or is he just there and it's just a byproduct and he just they come out? It's already there. Well, I, I imagine the opinion it's probably it has probably evolved to attack them because they're they're in the soil so much and mm. absolutely in the, by the millions in the soil. Yeah. But I'd imagine that it's probably it's probably. It likes the idea that it could infect them, and their life cycle suits it. Yeah. Um, but then again, there's another fungus called Cordyceps, yeah. uh, which is um, infects lots of different animals, uh, yeah. Uh, insects, yeah, yeah. and it, again, it attacks the brain centres, wow. uh, causes it then to sort of march like a zombie wow. up into the trees. <laughs> and when it's up there, it makes them kind of grip on with the claws and with the teeth onto the bark of the tree to hold on steady. And then in a massive fruiting eruption of fungus comes straight out through the brain and body. Oh. Cordyceps is one of the most terrifying mutants because I've now wrote a short story about it not so long, well, a few years ago now. Yeah. The idea that it actually started, you know, people went into the jungle and infected them. Yeah. And then, then, <laughs> then humans just kind of tore off the clothes and then slowly but surely ascended into the trees. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, I love that. But, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty kind of pretty scary fungus is that but again it, it's that affects a lot of different insects yeah yeah um, but this fungus so far they've only found it in cicadas wow. so but who knows Protect. it might cross across it might mm-hmm. knows so if you were uh, if you hear the whirring of, uh, of the uh, thunder or oh, the wings <laughs> <laughs> yeah you hear the, hear the wings chirping or if you find yourself whistling uncontrollably and your ass falls off yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with his mouth across to you <laughs> trippy shit dude <laughs> trippy shit So the thing is, you see, like cicadas, they're a flying insect, they can take to the skies, don't they? And you know sharks. I mean, they don't fly. Do they? <laughs> I you hope know, not. I mean, <laughs> well, oh no, not flying sharks. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a story about a particular case, and it's called the giant flying manta ray of Provo, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. And this is what I've got. Here. I mean, we don't often do these ones. This is this is a particular sighting. Yeah, this is yeah. a case of a particular sighting. Oh is. nice. And uh, and a good few people saw it apparently as yeah, well. Yeah. So and I, and I thought it was interesting. Recent years, I can't cool, get into it. I'm um, all eager. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll find it. We'll find out as we trot along. We'll find out as we trot along. So this is an account by that was uh, from Danny B. Stewart, right? And Danny B. Stewart is like a, uh, a bit of an investigator, psychic investigator, and all this sort of stuff, you know. And he does like ghost tours and all no, sorts he's... of things. You know, see, that's, it, that's his kind of thing. So yeah, this is by Danny B. Stewart, right? So um, so this is from a website called phantomsandmonsters.com, right? And again, this is uh, this was forwarded to this part website uh, yeah. by Danny B. Stewart, right? Uh, and his information you can find is at uh, Utah Stories. Right. You know, which is right. quite we'll check it out. Yeah. And this is what he says. About 11 years ago, a woman shared an interesting story with me. Late one June night, she was walking along University Avenue a little after 10 pm and near 300 south when she saw a gigantic black manta ray flying across the Provo sky. This thing was 400 feet in the air, coming from the southeast and flying northwest. It had a 14 foot wingspan, and its body and tail were probably 25 feet long. Oh, wow. It flew directly over Provo City Tabernacle, now a temple, and eventually disappeared into the night. Is this Nick Coast? What? what? Utah is landlocked in it. Is, it. is it Utah? Uh, this is Utah. Utah's one lot. It's yeah. middle, yeah, middle, middle, yeah, you middle, middle. No middle. water there. <laughs> Nothing, right? Yeah. Now, he says I didn't put much credence into this saying. <laughs> but <I> did. <laughs> what? <laughs> but I decided to share it on my ghost tour anyway. The original Provo Utah ghost tour with Danny D. Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Catchy title. It is. Catchy name. <laughs> it was a lark. Plus, there are similar stories of strange flying beings found all over the world. But this was a rarity for Utah, a one-time event 
Or so I thought. Huh? In 2013, another woman presented me with an almost identical story. She saw something in June 2011 that was the same size, shape, and was flying the same trajectory. It even appeared around the same time as the other one. So this is, I guess it's 2011 sightings, only nine years ago. God, this is fascinating. Yeah. Years passed. Local ghost and beastie stories were told. And I began to grow tired of telling the Manta Raid story. I was about to retire it from my ghost tour completely. But in September of 2018, I was standing in front of the Provo Temple, giving one of my tours, actually talking about said beastie, the Manta Ray, when one of the attendees began to look a little bewildered, almost worried. My girlfriend and assistant Tara approached him and he says to her, I saw it, just, just recently, this year. He saw something much like the Manta Ray, climbing on the side of the old tower of the Utah Valley Regional Medical Center. Climbing. I'm paraphrasing here, he says, this is in brackets, and basing this on what Tara told me, he relayed to her. It was big and black in color, climbing on the side of the building like a bat would climb on the side of a barn oh, door. that's gross. It climbed to the top of the tower, leapt off, and flew into the night towards the northwest. I have tried to get more information from this gentleman, but he has been reluctant to share anything further. Funnily enough, another person came forward a month later with another sighting of a flying ray, although this sighting was not in relation to the Provo Beastie. Again, I was giving a tour and talking about the ray when I saw a young man whispering in amazement to his girlfriend. I approached him. And as we were walking to the next ghostly location, and he told me he had seen something exactly like I described while he was surfing in California. He said it was huge and soaring in and out of the clouds. Oh, lovely. There was an overcast. He watched for over 15 minutes, and it would appear and disappear within the clouds until it flew out of sight. He had never told anyone about what he had seen because he was afraid people would make fun of him. He also had nothing to base up what he had seen on. This is the case for many people who have experienced extraordinary events or have had sightings of which can only be described as ghosts or monsters. People all over the world are seeing and encountering things that have no place in their historical or mythological memory banks to fit in so they sit on them. Nevertheless, for these people to be believed, and if they did indeed see some kind of large flying animal over Provo, Utah, then we have another beautiful cryptozoological mystery on our hands. Oh mate, that's one of my favourite stories you've, you've casted. I love that. A ray, you can't mistake a ray shape, can you? You know what I mean? No. Mothman's a little bit there because he's supposed to have a right short head, hasn't he? You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah, still, yeah. the description is totally different to Mothman. Like, no yeah. big glowing red eyes or any of that sort of thing. No screeches, nothing like that. Well, the weird thing is it crawling up a building. Oh, that's, that's creepy. He's isn't it? so creepy, especially with those big flappy wings, you know yeah. what I mean? Oh, and those little mouths have gone. Oh, that's so, that swimming. I love that idea yeah. as well in the sky, just swimming about but yeah. flying. You know what what I mean? do, you think, do you think that's what we've seen? Do you think we've seen a, a ray? Do you think it's something weird? Is it a pan dimensional creature? That's what I'm thinking again, you know, like you say, without cryptids. You know, about now, it's just like, it seems like have they always been there or they're getting stronger at the moment because it's getting the thin shit. places that can become thinner. Exactly. Oh my god, I love the idea. I yeah. love that there's multiple witnesses, different types of people doing it on the tour and he's heard of it yeah oh that's a great story but well, the weird thing is there's a little bit of an, an added like a, a, an added bonus to this particular story yeah now I disagree with this but yeah. I'm going to just give you a quick rundown of it. I'm not going to say the full piece because you know it's quite a long thing but what they're saying is um, oh yeah it's, what has been cited is that in a, a, in, a, in a particular space in some of the old hospital towers was huge colonies of bats right. now what the thinking could be or what he seems to think this is and he, he says oh yeah this is it, this, that's fine and this is Danny B. Stewart saying this yeah. they'd seen the bats and seen the trajectory of where they flew from which mm. is the uh, same direction, southeast to northwest, right 
stopping at the tower, landing on the tower and going yeah. in and all this sort of stuff. And he says, oh, that's it. It's bats. That's all it is. Like a swarm of bats in the shape of yeah. bollocks, man. You don't, when people see something, you don't mistake it that much. You, your brain automatically wants to see a solution to it, doesn't it? And Absolutely, it's a wall, yeah. one there with bats. You don't think of, you don't think of giant manta ray. Yeah, especially you, you've sat 15 minutes watching it going in and out of clouds and stuff. Well, the things I've seen recently, one of the things I've been looking at um, quite a lot on like, YouTube and stuff like this, is like um, swarms of either, well, flocks of birds or flocks of bats. Yeah. Acting, and they the do take a tight, dark, swirling mass in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a constantly changing shape. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't stick to one particular shape and then fly yeah. in a flat in unison. Motion. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're not all joined together and make one big bat. <laughs> <laughs> it's super bad. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and which, of course, the manta is a bat fish, isn't it? That's ah, another name for the manta. That's nice. Yeah. I like that. So there's a little bit sort of like a, a, a coincidence. I like but that you watch that shit on YouTube. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Well, it's because people see things, but nobody's turning around ever and saying, oh, it looked like this or it looked like yeah, that. Yeah. All it looked like is a, a, an amorphous black moving mass. Yeah, man, psycho well, pumps. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. Well, one of, the, one of the interesting ones I find is actually uh, moths and insects yeah. um, in gigantic swarms. People say, oh, we've, we've seen these movements on, on radars and stuff. Turns out it's moths. Um, we had a flying ant incident a couple of weeks ago yeah. coming in, didn't we? And it was yeah. just like you can see it on radar. It's so just yeah. like, oh shit, it's coming. You, yeah. you know what I mean? It's really coming to like, down the south. Yeah, so you, it's these things, but you don't equate it with a particular animal. Yeah, you don't say it's yeah. an eagle or it's something flying or exactly. a dragon. Exactly, a ray. Or... It's so yeah. bizarre that people can take that shape and it's a moving mass of different creatures and they all saw the ray shape. Yeah. Nah, that's nah, something bigger. That. That's something bigger and weirder, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great tale, yeah. great tale. <laughs> Gone into the into the trees and into things flying with the from the, from, from, the from the ground from the ground, and then we've been to the flying mantis flying <laughs> through the sky. I think we should just keep going up. Yeah, let's go, let's go to space. <laughs> oh, a little bit of space here. Yeah. And this is a story by Sanya Jane for the NDTV.com, and it is NASA designed perfume brings the smell of outer space to oh. Earth. Oh, now is it burnt matches or something? A bit sulfury or something? I can't remember, I've heard this before. Oh, the moon smells a certain way. That's yeah, it, maybe not space, moon, yeah. I'll, I'll retract that. Yeah. A fragrance that smells like outer space may soon be available to the general public, years after it was developed to help astronauts get used to the smell of space. God, this is cool. Yeah. According to CNN, Ode to Space was developed <laughs> by Steve Pierce, a chemist and the founder of Omega Ingredients. Mr. Pierce was originally contracted by NASA to recreate the smell of space in 2008 as part of the space agency's mission to eliminate any potential surprises for astronauts going into space. It took him four years to perfect the fragrance. If you're curious about what outer space smells like, Peggy Whitson an astronaut and former resident of the International Space Station told CNN in a 2002 interview, it's kind of like a smell from a gun right after you fire the shot. I think it kind of has an almost bitter smell in addition to being smoky and burned. According to Unilad, Mr. Pierce also took inspiration for the fragrance from accounts of astronauts who described the smell of space as a mix of gunpowder Seared steak, raspberries, and rum. Mm. Oh, I want to go to space now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yum yum rum. <laughs> One of my favourite things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love raspberries. I think. Raspberries yeah, are raspberries. Are. The smell, I prefer the smell to the taste. Yeah, but raspberries and dark chocolate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the team behind Odor Space is now seeking community support via Kickstarter. To help the public get a whiff of space. Oh, I'd buy it. Yeah, I'd I would. I'd have a bottle of that. 
The smell of space has been locked behind need to know astronauts only field training, and red tape for many years reads the Kickstarter campaign. Now we need your help to mass manufacture it so that everyone can experience the smell of space for themselves. In an update posted three days ago, the team behind Oda Space said it had found 391 backers for the campaign from all over the world, along with over £20,000 worth of pledged dollars. Oh, well done. So Oda Space product manager Matt Richmond hopes the fragrance will increase interest in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and into that kind of learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there you go, the smell of space. I love the three things there. I love, I love space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number two, I love Kickstarter. I proper yeah, love Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like the little man who needs that massive corporations begging them all, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, the, pa- the people of pa- uh, power of the people is just fantastic. It's awesome, I just, yeah. I just love that, that. That's an option, uh, and I love how uh, intense the training is. You know, stuff that we can't ever imagine happens for astronauts. You know what I mean? Oh, They've yeah. actually created the smell of space to get him used to it, so there's yeah. no surprises. You think, well, what else do they do up there? You know, but, down here it's for them to pray it's for true, it. It's true, but at the same time, my my thinking is right, and I think that's a little bit of a bridge too far, is that smell that you're getting. Yeah. Because, yeah, because the thing is, you want a few surprises going to space. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, yeah, they talked about these. Because if, if I were already <laughs> up there, what they need to do in, in like space station stuff like that is they need, like, um, you, you're like a cool uh, Kulu. Kind yeah. Costume. Yeah. So when all the new astronauts arrive, <laughs> yeah. right, and they open it, uh, uh, airlock door, they say, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd have the face hugger rubber, you know, like yeah. first time, <laughs> face, you know, <laughs> face hugger fly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like just flying out, woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'd get you so bad at all, wouldn't it? Well, you would, you know. So, so they, and also, these are highly trained scientists and astronauts. You uh, know what yeah. I mean? If they get there, go. It smells a bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking out, isn't that? So, I heard a good one about aliens in it. First one that no one wrote on the table. You know, when John hurts on it and he freaks out. They knew obviously it's going to be a big scene, but no one knew it was going to burst out, and yeah. I didn't know that. I you knew see, that, for, yeah. did you? Because yeah, every time I watch fact. it now, you watch the movie, yeah. and you watch them, and you can see their faces going, "What the fuck?" Exactly. But to me, it's just the realism of that scene, especially it always haunted me. You know, first time you saw it, I was only really yeah. young. You know what I mean? But that impression it gave me, my yeah. God, you, the whole movie's like a wonderment, isn't it? You know, you yeah. just constantly, what the hell's that? That spacecraft, and why is it so big? That navigator thing on it, and it's just yeah, brilliant, about brilliant film. Pure originality. Yeah, 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 it is fantastic. And to think why, why marvelled about reason because I was a Star Wars kid, so yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And Alien is only about two years older than. I know. Is it seventy nine? So two years younger, so two two yeah. years younger. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Two years younger than Star Wars, and the difference between the two movies is, is light years different oh, one it does make Star Wars look quite tacky yeah, yeah whereas it's almost you know suddenly we have the space movie for us you know yeah yeah I definitely yeah it was yeah, yeah. yeah. like, you know what I mean but is it old are you sure it's that way now uh, no it's, it's younger sorry it's younger uh, it's Star Wars is younger isn't it? no Star Wars is old 77 wasn't it Star Wars oh what's Alien then I thought Alien was 79 yeah that's some makes it younger yeah yeah Star Wars is younger than Alien no <laughs> I, want, I want a Google challenge on that one. Well, if you think 77, yeah? Yeah. Right. And you're saying Star Wars was 77? Yeah. Yeah. And then then, and then Alien 79. 79. Star Wars is younger, isn't it? Ah, it's older. Fucking <laughs> hell, I'm tired, mate. Sorry, dude. We're keeping that in. Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> There's no need to make you look even more benny In space, no one can hear you at all. Right, so it's time we brought you back down to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's best. <laughs> Get a bit dizzy there. <laughs> you got so dizzy up there, you couldn't do your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Never been that good at it. Anyway. <laughs> so let's go to something a bit more 
chilling. Mm -hmm. So this is a case of the lantern men who haunt the Cambridgeshire families. Oh, cool ghosties. Ghosty times. Lovely. Right. So this is from Fiona Leishman for cambridgenews.co.uk. It's no secret that Cambridgeshire is home to some incredibly spooky sightings, and the Fens seem to be a particular hotspot. Whether it's the ghostly monks that still roam the grounds of Peterborough Cathedral, or the infamous Black Shuck wandering through the Fens. What are the Fens? The Fens are like, um, it's flatland which are flooded and being drained right. um, and stuff. But the thing is, it's a bit like you know, Lincolnshire. And oh, you know, God, all, yeah, those flatlands. Yeah. They are bloody haunting here. Yeah. Well, that. these, these the, the Lincolnshire fens basically run into Cambridgeshire fens. Oh, so right. Very, very much I've been there, there for a bit, haven't I? I did a year and a bit of it. did a stint down yeah, there. Yeah, I didn't like them at all. Yeah. I really missed hills, proper missed yeah. hills. I couldn't wait to get back to where was. Well, this is, a, this is a, 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 some of our, our, our friend, friends of the show. Uh, he's uh, the people from Plastic Brain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Melody Good Clark guys. and Richard Daniels. Yeah, I mean they're, they're both uh, they're both down there in the on the flatlands. Yeah. Well, originally Melody, Melody's originally from Yorkshire. All so oh, right, Jews, yeah. Lass, yeah, uh, sweet, point. sweet. So, so a big big shout out to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's better getting out of Jewsbury and living down there. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I think it's Jewsbury or Doncaster. Can't yeah, yeah. Doncaster. It might be Doncaster. Yeah. I might be right in Doncaster there. Um, but yeah, so but they're living down in Lincolnshire. Cool. So, uh, but they, they they find it a lot of weird stuff. I bet there. they're yeah, easy, yeah. spooky, spooky places. Hopefully, what we can do, we're gonna hopefully get together with them sometime. Yeah, yeah, we'll, definitely. Yeah, we'll do a joint show. Yeah. So yeah, watch the space or listen to the space. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we've got Black Shuck down there, you know. Um, so there's noticeably less information available on these lantern men compared to say the Black Shuck. Haunted Crossing, which oh, I've right, yeah. yeah, or any of the haunted pubs, but we've managed to piece the tale together for you. So get cosy, grab a cuppa, and get ready for the terrifying tale of the Lantern Men. So who are the Lantern Men? According to the folklore of the Fens, the Lantern Men are often seen around Wiccan Fen and other areas. Described as an atmospheric ghost light, the lights, believed to be evil spirits, attempt to draw their victims to a watery death in the reed beds of the fens. The lights dance and twist their way over the dark surface of the great mirror, or skip erratically in and out of the reed beds, and are apparently drawn to the sound of whistling. Thought to be a variant of the Will o' the Wisp folklore, one method for evading the terrifying spectres is to throw yourself face down in the muddy ground with your mouth pressed firmly into the ground. While the will of the wisp is thought to have lured travellers to treacherous areas, the lantern men of the fens appear to attack whoever came into their vicinity. In a 1900 copy of the Eastern Counties magazine, a novel way of escaping their clutches is outlined for those who find themselves walking a fence. Apparently, if two men stand on opposite sides of a field, and one found themselves with a lantern man drawing in, attracted to their whistling, the two men could whistle in turn from the opposite sides of the field, and if they're far enough apart, this could lure the lantern man back and forth until they were able to make their escape. Sweet little idea. Yeah, it's a plan. You need, you need a plan, yeah, plan to plan it for. If you thought that carrying your own torch would deter the lantern man, then you'd be so mistaken, as reports from sightings said that he always in fact ran toward the light. In the 1870s, Walter Rye wrote, Once I heard a woman following a man while he was carrying a lantern on man. The man knew what to do. He set the lantern down and ran away as if the devil had kicked him. And when he ventured to look around again, there was the lantern man kicking the lantern over again and again. In the book Cambridge Folk Tales, Maureen James tells of a local man who had attracted the attention of a lantern man while whistling to his dog who was walking on the fen. In an attempt to escape the man, he had taken shelter at the home of a friend, who hung out a horn 
on a long pole to distract the spirit. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the following morning, the horn was found to have been burnt up. Now, I'm not sure where a horn, how a horn would distract a lantern. Well, I don't know. Mm. What he's horn. Doing that? Unless he blew it in like a big whistle. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, you know, yeah, maybe there's something to do with the whistle. Bit of horn, did you see? Well, what's this? I like the shape. <laughs> Horny for horns. <laughs> It is thought the lantern men lured the unsuspecting Joseph Bexfield to his death in the Norfolk Fens. Well, so you've got the Lincolnshire Fens, you've got the yeah. Cambridge Fens, they're all linked all these yeah. Fenlands, you know. The Quarryman. I don't know what a Quarryman is, but a Quarryman had been enjoying a drink with his fellow sailors in August 1809 when he remembered he had left a parcel for his wife on the Quarry. I imagine some sort of like a like, ferry boat kind of thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Fearing her disappointment and cold reception from more than any lantern man, Joseph decided to leave the inn to travel back to the boat and grab the parcel, before walking back home to his wife and two children. Despite the pleading from his friends not to venture out into the night filled with lantern men, Joseph pointed out to his friends that he knew the marshes near his home well, before heading off into the eerie darkness outside. That was the last time he was seen alive. When Joseph failed to return home or show up to work the following morning, a search of the marshes was carried out. No trace of the 38-year-old was found. Joseph's body finally washed up on the banks of the River Yare three days later. His grave sits in a Fulton churchyard with his headstone inscribed with a verse that reads... O oh, cruel death that would not spare, A father kind and husband dear, Great is ye loss to ye three he left behind, But he they hope will greater comfort find. According to the Fenland storyteller Jack Barrett in East Anglian folk tales, a shadow figure can still be seen in misty nights, wandering over the marshy grounds. It is thought to be the ghostly figure of a wherryman, such as Joseph Bexfield, being lured to his demise by the Lantern Men. Though to some the Lantern Men were just uncanny apparitions, a strange spectre floating across the fens, to others they were harmful to anyone unfortunate enough to cross their paths. There was a belief that it was able to take away a man's breath. Though there is in fact a more scientific explanation for this. The marshy fenland lets off gas, and it is now thought that the flickering lights seen were actually the spontaneous combustion of marsh gas, which happened on warm nights in rotten swamps and bogs. And there you have it. Spooky dookie, dude. <laughs> I love it. That's oh man. Yeah. So many kind of uh, images come through. Like one, our classic movie and book, you know, Whistle and I will come to you, my lad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is, is, is that Mar James? And yeah. you think, is that some coincidence or is it do you a little bit of inspiration for Mar James? Yeah. And then the Will of the Wisp and all that sort of stuff. Look, fairy lights, you know, walking on people, yeah. you know, things lulling you in. And even if it's just down to just plain old gas, you know, spontaneous combusting and that, that's still some freaky, spooky yeah, stuff. I so. love that. Well, it's, um, I like to say, corpse light is another word. Yeah, for I've heard well, that. Yeah. Isn't that a lot of rings or something? There's, when they're going to Mordor, do, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of all that gaslight and horrible stuff in there. Well, do, do you know through. where it, it occurs around here? Oh, where? Eh? Ah, without peaks or something. Oh, Pete, that's yeah. the release of gases on certain times of the year. I tell you like what that. else, old Robo Pete, he lets off some gas at all, <laughs> doesn't he? <laughs> Chuffing loads of it. Oh, you want to be careful because he's like a wherryman, isn't he? <laughs> he's, he's only got pipe on going, yeah. blow the old boat up, stinky oh, old man. tramp. <laughs> it's not bloody pickle eggs, is it? He <laughs> lives off her, though. I've never seen him eat a well. <laughs> but no, so I mean, I. I think it's one of those things off the fens, off the you know, marshy lands. Uh, I, I mean, we do know that you know, the gases are released and stuff yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. and it does make an explanation. But you don't explain how people are killed in a horrible way, does it? It don't. I think it's a little bit lynched. It's like a, it's almost like a ghost of the past. Anyway, he's the gas, isn't it? You know, I mean, we're living yeah. organic stuff, and then <laughs> That's it's very true, actually, you know what I mean. It's come rotten. back to life in a you know flare, hasn't it? In yeah. a sense, you know. Like, oh, this I'd is like how it lights up. Mm, yeah, what's the spark? You know what's what I mean? The spark that yeah. sets it off. 
But then again, I suppose you do see sometimes in certain areas, like uh, these little, um, I don't know, it's like little spouts of gas come out and, and are lit, you know. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't know how they come, what's things like? Ghosties, that's what it is. Ghosties, isn't it? It's it ghosties, is. Arky. Yeah, that's good. Because yeah. the one I heard about your yeah, Ilkley Moor, it was... Um, it was somebody who was lost on Mars. Right, yeah. And they were, I mean, I don't know if you know how treacherous so I've been I've heard there's yeah. some bad ones, yeah, yeah. Really, really dangerous place yeah. where you can just, you can go into some of those markers that they never come out. Oh, and he was thinking, oh, Christ, this is it, I'm done. Yeah. There was some multicolored lights that appeared in front of him. And he thought, well, well, I'll follow them, I've got no chance. Yeah. And he did, he followed these light, these lights and took them to the path. Oh. You know, and whether it was just coincidence, he was actually, he actually sort of following just um, the swamp gas mm -hmm. or whatever, I don't know, but he was, he, he got into safety that way, one way or another. So he looked yeah. good. He was down lucky, but we don't yeah. have any worry men on top of there, do we? <laughs> yeah. yeah, a bit far so away. A bit far away yeah. for that. So. Oh, good tale, though. Yeah, wow. yeah, spooky stuff now. Yeah. <laughs> have a little talk about that. Oh, well, yeah, are you done? <laughs> bit, bit of spirits. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been killed by something of a supernatural nature. It's pretty terrifying, oh, isn't God, it? One way to go, you know. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> but you know, that's the thing. I mean, in England, you know, we, we think it's quite a calm place, but mm. the, the, the nastiest thing can occur to you, can't Don't it? Definitely. You know I mean? um, but this is the story of Hannah Twinoy, right? Mm. Weird old name, yeah. there, you know. Twinoy. So she, I mean, poor lass. I mean, she she didn't have a um, a good name. <laughs> 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 she had a very long life. I was oh, gonna say. Right, she had a very long life. So she thinks she was born roughly around 1669 to or 19, 1670 yeah. and died in October 1703. Oh. Right, so it's only about 33 years old, something yeah. like that, something like that, right? But she died in a weird way, mm. right? And something kind of killed her. Right. So what do you think in England could kill someone? Well, let's think of something that unlikely to kill her. Right, so that falling out sky ride or something. Is that what you're mean? thinking, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Anna Twinoy is believed to be the first person to have been killed by a tiger in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Twinoy was an early 18th century barmaid working in the White Lion Public House in the centre of the English market town of Malmesbury, Wiltshire. Her death is recorded in the Malmesbury Parish Register, which records the burial of 24th of October 1703 of Hannah Twinoy. Killed by a tiger at Ye White Lion. A bit of irony there, yeah, isn't there? Bless her. <laughs> <laughs> her gravestone survives in a corner of the churchyard in Malmesbury Abbey, with a memorial poem alluding to her death. A memorial plaque with more details was recorded by an antiquarian in the nearby village church at Hullivington, but is now lost. What, the poem's lost? Like? <clears throat> uh, uh, the memorial plaque uh -huh, at right, the yeah. gravestone. So he's, the gravestone is he's still there. A gravestone records her name and death at the age of 33 on the 23rd of October, 1703, with a relatively long, evocative poem which reads, In bloom of life she snatched from hence, she had not room to make defence, a tiger fierce took life away, and here she lies in a bed of clay. Until the resurrection day. God, what's the tale here? How come yeah. she's getting mauled death <laughs> in a workplace and she didn't pull that tie? So, well, this, this is what we'll have to find out here. So, this is what the plaque records. Mm -hmm. To the memory of Hannah Twinoy, she was a servant of the White Lion Inn, where there was an exhibition of wild beasts, and amongst the rest, a very fierce tiger which she imprudently took pleasure in teasing. Oh, yeah. Notwithstanding the repeated remonstrations of its keeper, one day, while amusing herself with this dangerous diversion, the enraged animal, by an extraordinary effort, drew out the staple, which is like the pin holding the gate shut, sprang towards the unhappy girl, caught hold of her gown, and tore her to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I think fair do. You, you tease a tiger, that's <laughs> what you get in it. Historian John Bowen has found, not Jim Bowen, 
and Bully's special prize. A mauling by a tiger. <laughs> Here's what you could have won. <laughs> so historian John Bowen has found a local history with a more detailed account of the death. As it states, placed on a plaque on the wall of a parish church in Hullovington, a village five miles away from Malmesbury. So that particular little piece there that had been torn to pieces and that, that was um, that was from the plaque that was put on the uh, on the wall at Hullovington on the uh, uh, parish church. All oh, right. Yeah. So it's about about five miles or eight kilometres from Malmesbury. Yeah. But what the thing is, it reckon it got nicked, got nicked and melted down. <laughs> That's a shit thing to do with it, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the oral history of the story, right, the common thread of such things, right, from word of mouth to generation, from generation to generation matches exactly the plaque right. so it is right yeah, yeah you know so she was a barmaid working at the pub called the white lion but what the saying is it wasn't actually kept in the pub all the time it was like a traveling menagerie right. and it arrived and it set up in the pub's large rear yard so that's yeah. why it was set up there and there was that's where the tiger was and everything but so yes yeah, so she 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 taunted the tiger and because of that, she had the unhappy <laughs> sort of record of being the first person in the UK killed oh, by in Britain killed by a tiger. Imagine having a bite though. You, you're not going to do a lot. You know, you need to be heavily tooled up to kill a tiger. Oh, you? you just think, well, oh, she's she's caught, you're right off guard. Yeah. Well, like I've actually been there, and I've well, seen in the pub. Seen, no, uh, well, the pub's now a private residence. Right, being yeah. outside the house of where Oh it happened. wow! Yeah. Uh, and I've seen the gravestone. The gravestone. Cool. Uh, we have found the gravestone in the Abbey at Malmesbury. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nice town, Mal- Malmesbury. Big fan of it. Really, very, very nice. Yeah. But um, can you imagine all that? You just fanning around with a tiger in oh. a cage. The size of them. They're absolutely huge. Do you know what kind of tiger it was? A Bengal or what? I don't think. I don't think even then, at the time, the people with the tiger would have yeah, known yeah, different time because, them. because it was so so long ago. You yeah. know, they've been amazed just to see a tiger. Yeah, yeah, if you see prints of things like rhinoceros at the time, and things like that, they're amazed to see an elephant. Yeah. I mean, even then, the gorilla wasn't even discovered. Wow, still undiscovered. Really it was the gorilla at the time was seen as a mythical beast. Yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah, you know what I mean? So this is what's gonna happen with our old old friends that like uh, Bigfoot, uh, yeah. Yeti and all this yeah. sort of stuff when they eventually found one and catch it and you know and they'll yeah. turn around and say, Well oh, yeah. real yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it real all along, you know. So but you know, I I think she were a bit of a daft last person like No, you don't be teasing animals no matter what do you especially no. cap- captured animal like that wild animal in a cage and no. you're fucking about with it. I think she deserved it to be honest. I think, with you. I think she had a lot of bottle for, t- for getting near the thing. But yeah. I think she was foolish and she used her sort of like bravery in a stupid kind yeah, of way. You know, right, you know? Yeah. And that's what I reckon with She's that. She's like torn apart by a tiger. Torn apart by a tiger. <laughs> 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 Quite foolish, don't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, if if Brady could argue, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, but she's stupid. She'd be a bit cruel, wouldn't she? Yeah, you know, that yeah, sort of stuff. We, we don't hold we're here at Crack and Curl. We don't hold with any animal cruelty. Yeah. Even if it was the dolphins and seagulls fanning around. I was going to say I'm fair with them. They start it. I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> you just finish it. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is actually one thing talking about the animals around this area. I'm just going to quickly chip in on this. Yeah, yeah. It's something we're going to follow up later. Is there's been been a bit of a news story this week that off the coast of Cornwall. Um, bluefin tuna have been seen. Wow! But the thing, you know, you know, they're amazing. I mean, the bluefin is the most prized, most expensive fish in the sea. They're massive, aren't yeah, they? Massive, I thought they were yeah. like little size at tin, like, but they're not. <laughs> size at <laughs> tin. <laughs> well, you just cut me now. That's it. That's what I thought. You know, you know what I mean? Better, pop it a bit and cut it out. You know what I mean? Oh, this little belly. Are huge, yeah, no, I'm like, scared of crap out of me when I see them on the yeah. yeah. Well, they used to argue um, that uh, you know, oh wow, these are amazing and stuff like this. Look at it, it's an exotic creature off our coasts. It's not at all. Uh. There used to be bluefin tuna fleets that would come out of Scarborough and that. <gasps> wow. The, and you, if you can see the footage of the bluefin <sighs> tuna they used to bring in, but they're hunting them to the local oh. extinction. Well, that's what it was, you see. But um, we'll, we'll cover this later yeah, um, yeah. because it's a little bit late now. And as we say, we're on the subject at the moment of one woman being foolish, yeah. but now we're after somebody of immense bravery. Oh, cool. We've got ourselves a little hero. 
and a hero in the shape of Lily Lenton, the woman who escaped from Armley Jail. <laughs> Sweet! <laughs> it's a horrible medieval building in there. Oh, it's bleak, in it? Yeah. And this is from the... Um, it's, well, it's like a blog uh, and a private website, is this? Roads to the Past by James Rhodes, a local historian. And this is a story he tells. On 17th of June, 1913, imprisoned suffragist Lily Lenton, also known by the alias May Dennis, was released from Armley Jail on licence under the terms of the so-called Cat and Mouse Act. This legislation had been introduced in the wake of a series of hunger strikes by suffragist prisoners. Lenton herself had been force-fed during the previous incarceration in Holloway Prison and had nearly choked to death when liquidised food poured into one of her lungs. Oh, God. That's like hell. Is that horrible? You know, you swallow it the wrong way and it just... Oh, yeah, it's it's like a liquid food. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. God, that's gross. Absolutely horrible. The act put an end to force feeding. Instead, hunger-striking prisoners were released on licence and re-arrested several days later, leading to a cat-and-mouse cycle of female prisoners going on hunger strike, being released, then sent back to prison. Mm -hmm. So, which is, you know, hard, mm -hmm. hard stuff for that, you know, because it's like you're getting released, you think you're out, next thing you know, the coppers are kicking mm -hmm. your door in again, you know, after you've had a few pies. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But Lenton exploited this better than most. Lily Lenton was born in Leicester on the 5th of January 1891 and trained as a dancer after leaving school. She was inspired to join the women's suffrage movement after hearing Emmeline Pankhurst and was jailed for the first time in 1912 for engaging in one of my favourite things they used to do, window smashing campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they did it. Yeah, 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 yeah brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant, yeah. And, um, and she was arrested under the, the first of many aliases Ida Inkley, she uh, called herself, uh, yeah. The Glasgow Tinkley. <laughs> <laughs> After her release, she escalated her campaign of direct action and pledged to set fire to two buildings per week. <laughs> <laughs> That's the start, it. Yeah. yeah, well. It was while serving a jail term for arson that she was force fed in Holloway. Uh, so that could have yeah. you know, killed her the right way there. And who's to say they weren't doing it on purpose? Yeah. Like, you know, made yeah. awful business. Her connection to Leeds arose from her arrest in Doncaster in June 1913 for another arson attack, following which she was remanded at Armley Jail pending her trial. She laughingly assured officers that she would not remain in custody for long, and what happened next could be the plot of a Hollywood film. Although the exact circumstances are unclear, she was released on license from Armley a few days later so 17th of June 1913 and it appears that she may have begun another hunger strike and then immediately feigned ill health to trigger the cat and mouse act so she knew full well yeah, you know, so yeah. she got it to get out <laughs> yeah. right? Bert Lenton was put under house arrest and police surveillance at the Chapel Allerton home of Frank Rutter the director of Leeds Art Gallery and a woman's suffrage sympathiser. So basically you'd have somebody with, with, with quite a grand, decent sized house. And mm -hmm. No, I will keep it on my honour, I'll, I'll look at it. On his honour with a name like that? Yeah, but... Ru <laughs> <laughs> on Rutter! <laughs> Hello ladies! Rutter by name! <laughs> <laughs> but a few hours later, a grocer's van pulled up outside the house. And the grocer's boy went inside with a delivery. What they did know was the grocer's boy was a woman in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Unseen by the nine police officers watching the house, Lily Lenton swapped clothes and places with the boy <laughs> and was driven off in the van, reading a comic and eating an apple. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like you it. earlier before yeah. you got cast in <laughs> She was whisked away to the Chained Bull pub in Moortown. Wow, oh, yeah. And from there to Harrogate, and finally to Scarborough, where she boarded a private yacht to France. Wow. According to one report, police only learned of her disappearance when they read about her in the local newspaper two days later. <laughs> Well, I love the yacht and Scarborough. That's what you know, she didn't get away. She didn't busted out. It's a full left the country. Yeah. <laughs> she returned to London later in the year to resume her arson attacks. Wow. For which she was arrested again and escaped twice more. 
During one of her escapes, she fled to the Lake District, wow. where she met and befriended the writer D. H. Lawrence. <laughs> So now, under another alias, the May Dennis name, yeah, yeah. she found herself back in Leeds in 1914, where she was put on trial for the Doncaster fire of the previous year. During her trial at the town hall, Lenton attempted to filibuster proceedings. So do you know what that is? No, no. Like filibustering is when, it, you, for example, if you've got a set amount of time to actually sort of like um, uh, convict or you know, yeah. court. And a lot of this times happens in Parliament and stuff. So they say you've got an hour, yeah, right. To so say we have to argue this in an hour, and so she stands up and starts to speak, and it's over an hour long. Yeah. But because you're not allowed to interrupt, ah. the, the time runs out and there's no conclusion. <laughs> and this sometimes has happened in America, wow. where they have 24 hours to discuss events, and it happened about two years ago, where a woman made a speech and she stood up in court wearing nappies what? and with liquid refreshment on hand and stuff oh, Christ, and she, she stop- spoke for 24 hours and filibustered this entire controversial thing she, she wow. got away with it yeah, yeah. but this is what Lily was doing she's trying to give it a go herself under the name of May Dennis so she attempted to filibuster proceedings with a lengthy speech in which she asked the jury to consider the extraordinary state of affairs which permits women who break laws made entirely by men to be brought before a court consisting entirely of men. After her conviction, she again went on hunger strike in army jail, and again she was released. The outbreak of the First World War gave Lenton a new cause on which to focus her considerable energy and bravery. She served as a nurse in Serbia, and spent time working in Russia and Sweden after the war, by which time some women had been granted the right to vote. In later life, she was a financial secretary for the National Union of Women's Teachers and continued to support feminist causes. And she died on the 28th of October, 1972, oh my aged 18. Oh, what a heroine, yeah, man. Yeah, do you a quick look at her? Yes, please. Well, there she goes, there we go. Look. Hello, baby. Yeah. She's, got, oh, <laughs> she's gorgeous, isn't she? Well, she's got this, she's got a very modern look about her. Yeah, she's got really long, long hair down about, we'll, we'll yeah. post this later on. But obviously, we're not we're not here to talk about her looks, we're here to talk about her bravery. Yeah, her yeah, he's just, yeah. He's just there, yeah, isn't he? She's got it all gr- from Exactly, <laughs> absolute brave, skilled, cunning, you know yeah. what I mean? Can you imagine the daring the setting fires? Oh, they need a movie. Movie about her, that's it. Dolly, it's it. That is absolutely fantastic. I'm not saying that will burn two buildings a week. <laughs> that is dedication to the cause, isn't it? Not giving a flying fuck about consequences, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, she's just going for it, and I think she's. I'm amazed by it. I'm yeah, like, oh, wow, yeah. wow, what a woman. Oh, you that's know? incredible. It's not covered enough in suffering jets, and you know, I know no, all the basics, you know what I mean, but you never, they've never had the. No, I've never seen the full story, and it should be out there, Mark. Well, the, the full story is so massive, it, it's, it's huge, and of course, like, Time, um, who were the historians of the time? But bloody men, yeah. So, this is why they were seen yeah. as almost the like Victor terrorists. always wins, yeah. doesn't it? You know, or writes it, history yeah. or whatever it is, it's there again, isn't it? Yeah, and absolutely. Shit. You know, but um, what I think we should do now, we should have another little tot of rum, and I think we should, oh, uh, toast. I think we should be having a little toast to Lily Lenton, the woman yeah. who escaped from Armory Jail. Yeah, yeah. So chin, you know, chin, 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 chin. Oh, lovely stuff. God, that's all that spice. <laughs> Now we sleeping tonight, Arky. <laughs> so, oh, on that note, I think it's only left for us now. We're going to get ourselves um, what we're going to have a little bit of a supper for tonight. What do you think? Mm, sardines, maybe. Well, a little bit, a little bit, a few sardines on toast. That'd be nice. Yeah, I've got some in the curry rather than tomato sauce, you know. Curry. You, yeah, no, it's a curry because curried sardines are really nice. Fuck that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have a thing. You smell like Robo Pete, I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, morning, it's going to be a, a bit blustery. Where do you curry sardine for? <laughs> It'll be more business. blustery than tonight. Awful business. <laughs> <laughs> You've been, it's been swamp gas, we don't like your farts. Yeah. You've been blowing all around the room. <laughs> we like my pipe. <laughs> Blow the whole thing. <laughs> so, what we're going to say now is a, it's, it's a goodbye from Crack and Cove. So it's a big goodbye from Matt. And a big goodbye from Benny. Take care, guys. See you later. There are three ways you may contact Crack and Cove. Either by email at crackandcovepodcast at gmail.com on Twitter at Crack and Cove 
or Instagram at Crockett Cove Pod. Ha ha!